It's Primus Tracks with Josh, Frankie, and Sawyer. What a couple of dumb shits. Try to go outside. Mm. Mm. I try to go outside. You likely know him from Primus, Charlie Hunter, Sausage, Rat Dog, Primus again, Rat Dog again, and if I took the time to fill in between those bands, we wouldn't actually be able to talk to him because he'd run out of the time. Uh, the pleasure and the duty is mine to say, Jay Lane, welcome to Primus Tracks. Always getting hired, never getting fired. <laughs> Hi, Jay. It's a privilege. <laughs> what's up? What's up? Uh, that's a great way to kick things off. But, you know, before we proceed, and I know Frankie has a million questions, I have to reveal to you all right now that on and off for the past month or so, I have caught myself singing... In a moment of idleness, new variant, and I have to thank you for contributing uh, to my relief oh, <laughs> throughout you this COVID malaise, man. Oh, oh man, yeah. Sorry. Oh, it's killer. I'm going to put it on the bumpers I, for this so thing. Stupid. Every now and then I come up with one, you know. I had a dumbass jam about uh, the last one I came up. You know, it, you know, it doesn't come too often, but when it does, it's kind of funny, man. I had one about the dumbass uh, ancient aliens. Do you yeah. ever watch that dumbass? <laughs> That's movie? my favorite yeah. one, dude. <laughs> So I cranked a little jam about that dumbass shit. Anyway, I, I got another one. I got. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna come with with one about cyber collars. That's my next one, man. Cyber collars. <laughs> You're wasting my time. <laughs> I'm dropping a dime. <laughs> yeah, I got another one, man. Oh, there we go. We got a free preview. Thanks for that, Jay. Yeah. Are, so when these ideas come to mind, I mean, are these things <laughs> that <laughs> just kind of <laughs> fester in your head, and then you're like, I have to record this. Yeah, but it's not too often, man. I, I yeah. sit around. I just kind of sit around and stare at my shit. My ladies go, are you doing anything? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. So, like, I just kind of stare at my shit and, 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 and I think to dick around on the keyboard a little bit, make sure everything works. And then I kind of sit here, stare at the computer. But yeah, every now and then I'll come up with something. <laughs> I got my, I got, I got like keyboards and analog tape machines, all this stupid shit at home. And, uh, and, uh, down at my studio, I have, uh, my drums and shit. I teach lessons down there. Yeah. Um, Shelves and shelves. Machines. Come on now. And, uh, yeah, but I, I, I've been teaching lessons, man. You know, I'm pretty good too, actually, man. I mean, just, I mean, uh, cause, cause teaching, teaching is, 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 is interesting. Cause you, you get a lot of like, like you could see like, like a lot of people are, they get a little scatterbrained, you know, like, like some people try and, and especially teaching a lesson over zoom, right. It's mm-hmm. like, you're trying to, you know, so they, they're kind of seeing it. They're kind of seeing you're sticking the way you do it, but they're, they're also going off the sound of it. And this one guy needs the shit written out. And then I could tell he gets very like, he'll play it. Okay. All right. Now what? It's like, go oh, keep playing, man. Keep, keep playing. And then, you know, I'm trying to get him to, 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 uh, to think of it as not just little things, each each little separate thing, but but I've uh, I've been able to to get to get these people that are a couple of beginners. I got them actually pretty good, man. You know, already kind of just breaking down certain rhythmic things that kind of pop up o- over and over. Uh, that that like are the at the crux of like almost everything, like like a like a two against three, like you know, like like if you go. If you go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, like that, right? So that that's in like everything. That's like like to that gets get to that right. That that's that that's that it's like it's it's the basis of every almost every combination. Basically you know your hands hit together and then they're not together yeah you know and then they're together and then they're not together and uh trying to get these kids to think about it and shit like that you know anyway i'm getting off the off the train of thought here but uh no no you're (laughs) (laughs) frankie and i both being teachers of a sort we can totally uh we can totally get down with that idea of having to really break it down to the absolute basics and even sometimes that's not enough and you have to yeah. find another way so yeah i appreciate that so you can get tim Sawyer on the show to try to help guide you through the basics <laughs> i appreciate yeah, that man <laughs> well 
Jay, it's so great that you're here. Uh, it's so really just so cool to talk to you, man. I got to say, you know, Frankie talked to off air about uh, meeting you once. And, you know, I've never actually been in the same room with you. But just just one little thing, one time at a show up here. I think it was the first time uh, when you were playing with Primus that you guys made it up here to Southern Oregon. And, you know, you just walked on stage. I was right on the rail. And I just yelled, Jay Ski! And you just pointed at me and smiled. I thought that was the coolest thing. I was like, oh, he, yes, that's a good guy right there. That's you know. Cool. It's just one of those little things where you go, all right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, man. Right. I appreciate that, man. It means a lot. That means a lot because I had a couple of moments like that at, at concerts, you know, and that, that feels good, man, when you, you yeah, know. Exactly. You're totally, you're totally into the music, you know, and and, and, the, and that person acknowledges you for a second, man. Yeah. It's like, yeah. 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 I'm curious about that, actually, because, uh, you know, you, you play a ton of shows, but you've probably also been to a ton of shows, so... Uh, I guess I really don't know. Who are some of your musical heroes or the people that you really uh, look up okay. to? Okay, I'll, I'll start right with that. Take it from that thread is that the one time I was watching Miles, I was at the Greek theater. It was like Miles Davis, right? Oh, damn. God damn. In Lucky, 80s, man. Lucky. In, in the 80s, right? Yeah. And I swear to God, and like, you know, when you're at the Greek theater, like down at the bottom, there's no chairs. It was people just sitting like Indian style down on yeah. the floor, right? And there was a moment... It was the music was so cool, man. And there was a moment where something happened. It was a keyboard or some fat little chord happened. And like you could, it was almost like you could hear a pin drop. And I just, I went, ooh. And Miles fucking was walking across the stage and he looked at me. He goes, he pointed, he goes, yeah. <laughs> uh, Jay, yeah. that fucking really happened man like he, he caught the moment that you yeah he's got like it. ooh, he's like, he goes, he's like yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's oh, still like it's, i still almost can't believe that happened i shook james brown's hand nice. my band opened up for james brown at the circle star theater the freak executive Dude, the yeah. circle star theater awesome you know he said something to me i don't know what the fuck he said you know? <laughs> <laughs> my, my wife saw the rat pack there or no frank sinatra that was wow. just a Frank Sinatra there, like in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. early 80s. You know what I was thinking, man? That uh, the amazing thing is that, it, you know, of all the shows that we've seen and all this shit, you know, and then we, then we get out on the road, right? Like, I know, you, Soya, you've done, like, different size circuits, right? Like, you've done... I've like, done I've done little bars and backyards with you to yeah. stadiums with Roger right. Waters. But, and, so I've done a primarily the shit in between, the, like, the the thousand to two two thousand room yeah. years that usually end up being like the state theater or in San right. Francisco. Oh, if, if you want to talk about me playing drums, uh, the biggest I've played is like festivals in Europe on the second stage in front of ten thousand people uh, in Europe. But in yeah. the states, you know, the Warfield and stuff like that it was the biggest I played. And it's always so, opening for Primus well, or something like that. So the cool thing about the cool thing about that level of gigs, because that when we, when I was with Bob Weir, and then again with Primus, that was a lot of the circuit we did was those places, and those are all the old places that everything since vaudeville rolling rolled through town. Right. That was the fucking gig. I mean, Sinatra. Right. I mean, like go down as the. Buddy Rich, I mean, every yeah. every great traveling fucking thing from all time did that circuit, you know? That, yeah. That's that's pretty cool, man. You, you know? feel that when you're in those venues. You know, I do those all the times with all kinds yeah. of bands working, Jay. And, you know, I, you know, I, you get yeah. in those funky old theaters and weird spots around the U.S. and stuff. And it's like you feel the vibes, you know? Yeah. And there's, sometimes there's pictures on the wall and stuff like that you look at and you're like, and it's right where you're standing. Yeah. And it's like. You know, some Every super heavy there. from like yeah. the sixties is there. We were we were somewhere recently, well before this this pandemic. Some one of them tours I was on last few years, and they were like, "Oh man, this place is haunted. You want to check out the fucking haunted thing?" <laughs> you know, it was like some shit upstairs. Where you know, I don't the know. Eagles Ballroom, dude. Oh, maybe that was it. Where yeah. is that? The Eagles Ballroom. Oh, that's Milwaukee. Uh, Milwaukee. There's a swimming pool yeah. upstairs, and then there's a that's pool it. above that's that. The that's the that's yeah. the haunted that's level. The yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was it. <laughs> right on. Yeah. I've been there a couple times. Yes, yeah. of course. <laughs> I've never gone up and looked at the haunted stuff. Did you? I'm too scared. No, I, I didn't. I, I I don't remember. I I, I remember. Uh, I was on acid though, and I was really into it. You know, like, I was looking <laughs> to see some shit. You know, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds like it would enhance the experience big time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, fucking I've seen shows. 
Uh, the first first show I think I saw was the Jackson Five, man. They, they were at the, right the, the, the uh, Cow Palace or somewhere down here. And wow, that's cool. I remember seeing Earth, Wind, and Fire. They they headlined the fucking uh, you know uh, Oakland Coliseum, and, <clears throat> and for for years. And then I, I saw George Clinton even back in 1977 when I was 12 years old at the fucking Oakland Coliseum, man. Right. Wow. It was uh, it was the Barcades were opening, and then a band called Phase O was the first band. It was like, man. And all I remember is that it, it was like uh, the dr- the drummer for the Barcades caught his sticks on fire. And they turned off all the lights, and he took this badass drum solo. It was, it was yeah. the most amazing thing ever. I with sticks on fire and shit, man. <laughs> so the question at hand, Jay, is: is what was your drum influences as a child like that? Like, what yeah. really made you want so, to get into drums? You know. So I, you know, I'll bet you, I'll bet you to tell you the truth. I bet you it was seeing them on TV. Right? We were dudes our age. You know, there was like the the, the variety shows, and, and somebody was always playing the drums. You know. I, yeah. I used to like I used to like the fucking the the, the Jackson Five show and the Dos, Don, Donnie Osmond show and yeah and yeah they all played instruments and the fucking like every it was almost like everything on TV back then they 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 had some sort of musical thing there was somebody on drums or drums were on TV a lot yeah so for uh-huh. that and uh, and man you know what I got to really give it to to I think the thing that really did it was I mean, my mom was was nice enough to to, to take me around to find me a, a drum teacher when I was like, fuck, I think I was nine, I'm nine years old still. Wow, cool! Like that, that's pretty cool. Wow. Of you got the bug from what you saw on TV and said, yeah, "I want a drum she, set." She, wow. she knew I, I needed something to do with my hands. I could tell, you know, I must yeah. have been driving her nuts or whatever. Well, God, God bless her soul because she yeah. did the right thing. Yeah, I grew up yeah. without, without a father, so I only had the mother. So. Right. Yeah, wow, I, cool. I, I, was, All right. I was probably as big Not as I cool, am but now. okay. I was probably as big as I am now when I was nine years old. <laughs> you know, I was a big old fucking baby, and I, yeah. I, you know, I needed something to do. I, she could tell. But uh, I think the real turning point, man, was when I went to junior high school, and the jazz jazz band teacher at that school was a, was a sax tenor player. He just passed away, Jerry Logus, uh, local guy, local local old, older jazz guy. Uh, white guy. He turned me on to Weather Report, man. Yeah, uh, right on. In 1979, when the album Mr. Gone just came out, and, and it was like, and I remember him showing it to me, and I went and bought it, and that was it, man. That The, the minute I, I found Weather Report, that was like, I really found, I, f- I felt like I really found my music, man. Okay, really? so hold on. I gotta ask you, because I, I mix up Weather Report and Return to Forever. Weather Report was Stanley Clark? No, no, no. That's Return to Forever. Yeah. Return okay. to Forever was Al Dimiola, Stanley, Stanley Clark, Clark. Yep, Chick. Lenny Chick White, Corre- Chick Chick Corre- Corre- yep. Chick Corre- and Lenny White. Weather Report was a bunch of different guys, but it was started by uh, Joe Zalanol and Wayne Shorter. Wayne Shorter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And they they had met, they were playing with Miles in the 60s. They played on. Right, all. right. It was some ex Miles dudes that got a band yeah. together and called it they started, Weather Report. And they, they went right. through different bass players and drummers until they, they got Jocko. Right? So, yeah. Okay. So Jocko was in Weather Report. Jocko. Okay. And then we, right. when I saw Jocko, that, that was like the second coming. Man. That was right like, on. So who, who were the drummers in Weather Report? Billy well, there Cobham? Was, there was Narda, was one. He was badass. Okay. Brother. Yep. Um, Chester was Billy Cobham. Cobham in that? No, but he was a big influence too. I was into him as well, right? Uh, but it w- when I got into uh, Weather Report, it was Peter Erskine, yeah, was, ah, yes, yes. And dude, that I, I will say, I, I didn't know who Peter Erskine was until you told me that was some of the stylings of beats on that sausage demo you did. I was like, Peter Erskine, who, who the hell is that? And then I went and listened to some of it. I was like, aha, okay, aha. Yeah. Well, aha. That, yeah, because that's, man, I saw, I, and dude, that, that was, I saw Weather Report. I saw that quartet, Peter Erskine, Jaco Pistorius, uh, Joe Zanotto, Wayne Shorter at the Warfield. In oh, Maine. man, that must have been they, ripping. They, they were touring those theaters. That, that, that was yeah. like, they were like rock stars of jazz dudes, man. That's how, yeah. it was like, they were t- playing 2000 seaters, 2500, whatever it is over there. Yeah. And they were touring at that, that level before Jocko just, you know, fucking imploded, man. That's amazing, dude. 
Wow. And, uh, yeah. That, so that was devastating for me, man. When Jocko died, oh, you yeah. know, it's like really hit me hard, man. So and as then, a young guy, you're you're getting this influence from this all time band like Weather Report, but then you're naming all these other people that you're seeing live. And well, yeah, well, and then Prince, of course, Prince, no Prince comes yeah. out a few years later, and everybody's like, "Earth, Wind, and Fire, who?" Michael Jackson, who? <laughs> what, weather yeah. report, who? Oh no! Now I now get my hair and I got the little purple jacket. Or, yeah. You know, now I'm I'm the new little Prince guy. Everybody caught the Prince bug back there, back around eighty four, eighty three, eighty four. And I joined a band. I started a band called the Uptones, and uh, in about eighty three, eighty four, it was like a ska band in the Bay Area. And then I just hopped over to a, a funk ska funk band called the Freaky Executives, eight piece. Yep. Uh, eight piece uh, funk band, and that's how I made Claypool because we rehearsed in the in the same uh, warehouse uh, mm-hmm. in Emeryville as a bunch of bands did. I used to just hang out down there and I'd smoke weed. It would last, and we'd, you know, he would want to smoke some weed. Okay, come on over, and then <laughs> want to jam. Okay, next thing you know, we're jamming. Next thing you know, he's like, "Hey, I'm going to boot this guy out and get you in the band." I was like, "All right, cool." <laughs> then, <laughs> our, our, the freaking executives, we kind of had, had hit our apex so to speak, yeah. the big record deal and the gig started to drop off and cats started to, you know, replace other cats. And it was like, you could see the writing on the wall for it. And here's this guy, Les with the three piece going to play in little gigs here. And there. I was like, all right, let's do it. Yeah. And, then, uh, and, <clears throat> then, and then I started playing with Les and Todd Huth was yeah. the guitar player at that time. And uh, yeah. And then, and thank God we recorded a, 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 a little demo on a cassette. On a, the holy uh, grail of Primus recording. Yeah, on, 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 on a Tascam 388 quarter inch yep. eight, eight track uh, machine. Not even That's sure who has those tapes, either Lefkowitz or Todd. The or tapes are lost. It's it's confirmed. No one can find them. We've that, everyone has looked. We can't find them. That you know that's fucking Lefkowitz's fault. If anybody <laughs> blame or, Lefkowitz, that's what we heard. Oh boy. <laughs> or, or, or you know, anyway, nobody cares about that shit. No. Anyway. Except less because he can't release it officially, like off the raw tapes. You know. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh we, well, got a, we got a we got a cassette. I got a cassette of it. I do, do it. too. It's awesome. Yeah. Still rips. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I know. Yeah, Frankie definitely wants to ask about that sausage demo. But just before that, he's about to blow his top. I know he's going to yell at me after this. The, but I'm curious because it sounds like with your background, uh, as far as your musical influences and what you were listening to and seeing live and really enjoyed, and then what we know about Les's background because he was into some a lot of R and B uh, among other things. It seems like when you guys got together, you kind of spoke the same language musically. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no. It was real easy to play with Les because <clears throat> I had played all these funk bands and. Uh, and so when he was doing all this uh, 16th note bass parts, it was real easy for me to lock right in with a, you know, tricky little fucking shit. And I had the little tricky hi-hat shit to throw in there and, and get it nice and slamming up on top of the beat, <clears throat> uh, which I can argue, uh, had I stayed in Primus, it might have not really worked out in the end because as much as that, it, that was cool for me, I will divert now and say that Herb's fucking lumbering behind the beach shit, the tension between that and Les's shit is really the great thing that made Primus the great sound that it is. Mm-hmm. You know? But I, well, appreciate, I just appreciate having something to do with <clears throat> the part of it, you know, but, uh, I don't think I, you can't really discredit what the future might've been because you and Todd left though. You know, I really oh, no, feel like, like- the but, direction but, it was going was something. And because yeah, you guys was, bowed out, I, it became something else, you know? But see, I didn't see the uh, the mosh pit yet. I didn't mm-hmm. see the the nineties kind of came and everything fucking changed, man. Because yeah. I was playing with Les and Todd. God damn, if we had a gig every fucking like three or four weeks, maybe there was a gig. But it was like it was like two or three days a week in that room, just for a few hours, going over those tunes again. Smoke some weed, let's play them tunes again. That's why. If you ask me, those first Primus tunes are so great because he didn't just make it up and record it. He made it up and they played it for like months. And he was like, oh, let's make up another part. Yeah, oh, let's make up another part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Epic, epic fucking songs, right? Would yeah, you yeah, say? yeah. Epic yeah. Songs. Whereas like a lot of the later shit, it's just like, yeah, cool idea. Record. And it's like kind of like, you know, one thing a lot of this shit right so that's that was a really cool thing and it, and it was like oh man look at these guys and it's a weird thing is because i had met two dudes like that at berkeley college of music when i was there in 83 
I was there at Berkeley College of Music right out of high school. I went out there just till, till Christmas break and came back home, joined the Uptones. But uh, but I had met these dudes out there who was, who were like the same kind of dudes as a guitar player, a bass player. They went through drummers every now and then, but they had their whole little thing together. Like they could just play the guitar and bass without a drummer or anything. And that's how Les and Todd were. Like even because, you know, they I met them when Peter Libby was on, on the gig. Yeah. Yep. And then... And then he was off the gig, and then and then uh, Curve curveball got on, on the gig, yeah. and then and then I started hanging out with Les. Next thing you know, he booted Curveball and got me in there. But I, I remember it was just like him and Todd could just sit there and play the whole thing. They had the whole thing orchestrated, just the two of them, you know. Yeah. Well, dude, that sausage demo, man, that you were in there at that that moment is when I discovered Primus. I, I saw Primus once with and, Curveball, and it. Did, and it it did have a, it did have something to do with the way Herb approached it because Herb Herb might have not taken some of that into consideration had I not done that. So I know mm-hmm. I do I did have something to do. With of course, it. you had influence oh, on on the, the beginnings of Herb getting in there. He had to adhere to that snowball going down the hill that you Todd and Jay or you Todd and and Les had created. You know, and it's not to and not to discredit <clears throat> uh, Peter Libby or Curveball, right? But I really, I didn't play the shit any, any, anything like Curveball played it. No, he had nothing. He just played the beat. That was it. He had. No, a, he didn't bring any flair or, or or tension or pull or this or fill. He just kind of played. Yeah. And I saw that for the first time, and I was like, yeah, yeah, that bass player is amazing. Holy shit! But that drummer, eh, whatever. And he had the ice bell for the ride cymbal. Remember that? Oh. <laughs> he, that was his ride cymbal. I was like, yeah, okay, that's cool. I, I don't know. <laughs> and the next time I saw Primus, you were in the band, and, and dude, it was like the uh, the emoji with the head exploding. It was like, <laughs> now this is on, dude. Okay, now there's a drummer in here playing just like these other two dudes, you know. And I, you know, I wish I had stayed with it, but you know, because it was really fun. And I was kind of bummed out when Les was like, "Okay, man, you have to quit the Freakies," and I was like, "Hell no, I'm not quitting the Freakies," because he wanted to. He wanted Todd and me to go on the road. He was about to go on the road. He was like, "We're yep. going on the road." I'm like, "No, I'm not going on the road." Like that, mm-hmm. so that's that's <laughs> that, you know. But uh, but it's like imagine, imagine, like you know, it'd be a fucking different history. But I'm just glad I had a part in it. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, we both, Frankie and I, for sure, we love that sausage yeah. demo. And of course, I yeah. didn't really hear it until many years later, uh, after really cementing my Primus fandom. And I thought, wow, this is where this came from, and it's so different. I'm, I'm it's so interesting because some of it, so much of it is familiar, but so much of it is different. It's almost like an alternate universe, <laughs> you know, and it's really yeah. great to listen to and kind of pick it apart and go, okay, so this is, this became this and this didn't translate, but, uh, I love your drumming, man. I'm a big fan. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, and Todd and I are really close yeah. and, uh, we were actually, we are actually working on some stuff. He actually put some stuff oh, out. Cool. Um, with this guy, Eugene from, uh, Oxbow. So yeah. And, uh, but Todd stuff, man, I, <laughs> So the funny thing is, like, you know, back then, like, I didn't get Todd shit at all. Like, I got, I could play with less. Okay, there was something that's definitely like a rhythmic thing. I could lock right into that. Todd's mm-hmm. shit was just like this amorphous kind of like <laughs> weird. I couldn't even explain it, right? And now, over the years, but somehow he and I just personally get along really good. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we, he, and he's, you know, so we've gotten together a few times, and I try to play on his shit, man. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I, it's like some of the hardest shit to. To, to fucking figure out. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. Todd's hilarious, dude. And, yeah. And, yeah. He's put know, a couple of those things. Thing on YouTube is, I, I, I had Claypool on the phone the other day and I told him that I said, yeah, man, I'm playing with Todd. And, uh, and I was like, man, you know, cause sometimes you're like, okay, all right. That's a bar seven, four. All right. Then it's four, four. Okay. All right. There's a six. Okay. That's a six. Right. <laughs> but his shit is not like that. It's like, it's more like you have to go like this. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's like five of these and then your left hand takes over. <laughs> and that's the beat. <laughs> you know, it's like the yeah. eight notes get a do, 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 boom, 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 boom. And, and then I was like talking to Les and I was like, yeah, man, I can't even fucking tell. Even when I'm looking right at him, I can't tell when the fucking shit. It's somehow it makes sense to him and he'll play this shit the same every time. Mm-hmm. Kind of like a slower, really deliberate eighth note a lot of his shit is real eighth note driven, you know. Dun, 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 yeah. Dun. And then there will be some kind of quirky again that gets just 
completely the time just kind of like it, it gets really <laughs> weird <laughs> i can't even explain it now but but then i was telling les he goes i, I was yeah because I, I was probably reminding him of when he used to fucking try to jam with todd on one of todd todd's ideas and he goes i go yeah you can't even tell when he's gonna when he's gonna fucking change he goes yeah it's when he sniffs <laughs> <laughs> that's the tell huh <laughs> jay before we get into you know your chronological history with Primus and all this clip, uh, you brought up Prince, so I have a question about the time, because uh, Les Claypool brought up the song 777 uh, and on the Electric Grapevine book, he says that you're able to play the hi-hat part of that song on drums. So, was that like a song that he challenged you to play when you jammed with each other? What's the story no, no, with no, that no. track? It's, it's something that I taught him. I, I, yeah, I, now we're talking. Here we go. Here yeah, we go. Oh yeah, and I, I'll even take credit for some. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, I'm not even going to take credit for. Some, I'm going to step out on a limb here and take credit for some other shit too. Yeah, but, but, but no, it was when I was, uh, I think I was 16. I think when that album came out, or no, it, not when that. It was like a year or two after that. That album came out in 1981. I think I was. I was 16 and 81. So I went and saw Prince when I was 16 years old. I, I was hanging out with some kids. I grew up in San Francisco, you know, so yeah. that it, when I, we're in high school and there's like, you know, every, every now and then there's like a gay kid, like we're right there by the Castro and shit. Prince was huge with the gay crowd. Right. And I think it was this one gay kid. It convinced a couple of chicks and me to go, to go like, Hey, let's go see Prince. I got an extra ticket. And I was like, I don't like that shit. You know, <laughs> You know, I was in a weather report or whatever. I was like, Prince, what the hell is that? And I went, it was at the Civic Center. And this was the... this Controversy, was the, maybe? Controversy tour. Yeah. 1980. Blew my mind. Or maybe it was 81. Or 82. I'm sorry. It was 82. 82. The 10th grade. Or 11, 11th grade. Yeah. 11th grade, 82. Right? So I saw that one. Blew my mind. It was hooked. Who was the drummer? Do you remember? It was Bobby Z. Bobby Z. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, and then um, the next year, I went back and saw the 1999 tour at the Oakland Coliseum. Then the next year after that was the Purple Rain tour. It was five, five nights at the Cow Palace. Caught that. But anyway, back when I, I remember uh, first getting turned on to Prince when I was like 16 years old, and uh, and there was that song. I heard that song, and. I don't think anybody really cared that it was a drum machine. For some reason, that's yeah. that's the beauty of maybe the LM1, that first limb drum right. machine. Right. It had the certain it was a 12, 12 bit samples on this drum machine. But there's something about the feel of that drum machine, and maybe also the fact that there's the rumor is is that David Garibaldi, the drummer for Tower of Power, made a cassette there was a cassette a data cassette that came with the lm1 of pre-programmed beats and i think one of them was david garibaldi programmed and the interesting thing about that is if you will look at one of david garibaldi's most famous signature beats which is squib cakes you know that song i, I don't know it no yeah, i don't know that one anyway it, it, the beat it goes it's been used on a lot of samples but there's two open hi-hats at the end of it that if you place those one sixteenth note off, it's like, oh no, I'm or one eighth note. It's it's the same as seven seven seven. Okay. It's, it's like the same, like it's almost like, and and I don't know if Prince when he programmed that beat was messing around with that beat or somehow he. I think maybe they ended up to. to, 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 to did somebody maybe they were all loud in the studio and somebody was trying to go one two three and the click got ahead of them so they ended up programming something what that it was and they were like oh that's funky put a put a clap on the backbeat and let's call it a song you know so you have this groove where it's like a displaced thing and right, anyway, right. some some about that beat was so brilliant that i I wanted to learn that. So I learned that when I was 16 years old. I didn't meet Claypool until I was well into my 20s, man. 21, 22. I, I showed him that. So, uh, yeah. Nice. That's amazing. Awesome. Yeah. I, I thought that David Garibaldi actually programmed that beat for the Time record, like the version no, that's on no, it. No, 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 I, so, no. Okay, so the root of it came from a Garibaldi, Garibaldi recorded stock uh, beat. Garibaldi with Roger Lynn, the program. The guy okay, okay. Drums. 
they made a data cassette, which is very hard to find. So like a rarity now, if you could find right, it. Right, right, right. It's like a data cassette that you you know, you know you play the data into the drum machine. You know, that's how they transfer data back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. I remember. And it was the it that was a beat that somehow David Garibaldi made for like a a sample beat for your right. Drum. And it was a stock cassette, and like you say, the Prince and whoever was drumming with him, they figured it out or producing, and, they figured it out. You, you know what's so cool about that is that I think that drum machine came out in 1980. Right. And that sounds I, about right. And it cost $5,000. Ooh. And so did an Oberheim OBX. It cost about <laughs> $5,000. Yes. Wow. But somehow, Prince, so I think he did an album uh, probably 1980, 81, whatever. And, and, and he probably got a big advance, record advance for probably maybe the controversy album, whatever. And he went out and spent that fucking record advance. I bet he bought that fucking drum machine. He bought that <laughs> keyboard because nobody else really, only like, Super high end new wave bands and shit use that drum machine. Five thousand dollar drum machine. Unless you had a right. big record contract, you didn't really have that drum machine on your songs. You know, only the big studios and shit. And Prince really used the 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 the, the, the detuning of the claps and the way the the side stick. And he just used that thing that made it yeah. signature sound. Right. Uh, because I actually have one. <laughs> have you ever you ever sat with David Garibaldi and? You guys played it? Like, have you ever seen him play it like live? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The the, oh, yeah. the not his version of the of the data tape, but like the version no, no, that no, Prince no. came out with that you all know. Because yeah, you gotta learn that song Squib Cakes. That's like the, the badass Tower of Power beat song that starts off with a David Garibaldi beat this is like right. You've heard that one. Yep, yep, I know that one. Okay. Yeah, that's squib cakes. Anyway, uh yeah, man, David Garibaldi, man. That, that was my one of my biggest influences. I, if we go back to who's my influence, I'd have to say Billy Cobham, David Garibaldi for sure, and then like guys like Eddie Marshall and people that I knew in my life, you know, also, but, uh, um, Jay, I want to ask you about a collaboration that is really cool. And I think not enough people know about it. Um, it's a three piece that you did with Les Claypool and Rob Wasserman. Oh, yeah. And you recorded some studio tracks and you also performed at an award ceremony, a really amazing instrumental called three guys named Shmo. Uh, what can you tell us about, you know, that collaboration? Well, that's how I ended up meeting Bob Weir, actually, because uh, oh, yeah. Rob Wasserman met Les Claypool uh, in, in somewhere, I don't know. And then Rob Wasserman had a gig doing a commercial. He had a, he had got a gig doing a commercial for Levi 501 jeans and uh, and he called up Les. So he, would, he was thinking he'd do an upright bass and Les would do like, a, you know, electric bass. And then he asked Les if he knew a drummer. And so Les called me up. He goes, so I get, I'm basically sitting at home. I get a call from Les. He goes, hey, man, I got this guy, Rob Wasserman. You, you want to do a session down at Hyde Street Studios down here? And uh, I'm like, okay. So uh, so I show up. And it's John Cutler, who, who's the Grateful Dead sound guy, the engineer. He was on the session. I, I met him that day. And Rob and Les. And I met Rob that day. And then it's like, okay, let's get set up. Okay, let's get set up and get some sounds. All right, you know. And I'm used to like, man, I'm used to like freaky executives, like eight hour rehearsals. Oh, when we go into the studio, everything's super rehearsed. It's like, and here we are just jamming. Okay, all right, why don't you guys go ahead and jam and and make sure that everything works. Okay, we're jamming. Jam a little bit, jam a little more. Okay, all right, right. And, and all right. And okay, let's go and listen to it. All right, cool. Let's go listen to it. I'm thinking, let's go listen to it and see if, what we need to adjust or what we're talking about recording here or anything. What, you know, and we go in there and Rob's all, that's cool. All right, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I'm like, Wait, what? That's awesome. I'm like, we're done? Yeah. And, and then they were like, yeah, and uh, they want somebody to put their voice on here. And I don't want to do it. Les doesn't want to do it. You want to do, do it a little like Levi's 501. <laughs> so I did, I, mean, I got my voice on there and, uh, and I think, I think I made a little residual. Like I got paid for that session. I got a page a thousand dollars and it was like, fuck. I was like, man, that's like the easiest money I ever made playing. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that's they, awesome, uh, man. 
So then I think right around the same time there was a, or, you know, shortly after, you know, uh, there was a, uh, I think it was the Bammies or one of those shows at the, yeah. at, the at the Civic Center. And, and, and they had, a, and we did a, we did a song. It, it, it was a jam. We just jammed again. I, I, I don't remember if there was a song, but uh, I did less sing at all. Did he say anything on the mic? Nah, it was completely instrumental. It was yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. like the like the studio recording. Yeah, just one, two, three, go. I can't yeah. remember nice. what the hell they were playing. They must have had something they were playing. And, but, you know, I don't think it was big time chord changes or anything. <laughs> That's awesome. But anyway, dude, Rob, man, rest his soul, man. I, I, I really got to hand it to that guy because after that, he brought me up to Bob Weir's house to, to, to record on a... Uh, a, a musical Bob was working on about Satchel Paige, old black baseball player yeah. um, that never saw the light of day, unfortunately, but uh, uh, that, and that was with David Murray and a few uh, jazz guys. And <clears throat> so Rob brought me up to Weir's house to work on that. And, and we were like, Hey, let's add this guy to our duo. He had been doing a duo with Rob since like for six years prior to that. And so they just added me on their duo and shit. I think the first tour we did, Fuck, it was like, it was like, oh, it was right after Jerry died. We go out and fucking like, we were headlining the giant festivals and shit, man. And like, I had never played anything like that, you know? Nor did I know anything about the Grateful Dead music. But that's why I got the gig, you know? I, I wouldn't have gotten yes. that gig had I been a fan, I can guarantee you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He was looking for yeah. some, some outside inspiration he's like, yeah, he's yeah. like you, oh you don't know this music perfect <laughs> yeah. please come in and jam with me and don't but try course, to play don't dark star me. at yeah. red rocks right, right, no. 79 uh, now, now of course look at me I, and i end up with fucking dreadlocks and tie dye and burking stuff I'm like oh shit i man, damn how'd that happen <laughs> <laughs> when, I go, I, when i go rejoin primus in, in 2010 you know, I'm all showing up. Hey, man! It's like, no, dude, you gotta put on like a black t-shirt. Or, you know, that's why you gotta wear the wear the fucking monkey hat, and the fucking jet vest. You know, so I can be like, okay, all right, no, 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 no tie dye love in Primus. Huh? Oh, <laughs> Primus wasn't bad. wasn't the the t-shirts and jeans band anymore, dude. It was <laughs> it was a show of their yeah. own. You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Jay, that actually clears up a big mystery for me because I got a promotional CD from Discogs a few years ago, and the only reason I got it is because on the track list it has a song called "Can't Live Without," and I thought that it was maybe like an additional recording from the session with Rob Wasserman, but it turns out it's just you know an extract from three guys named Schmo, and it has somebody speaking over it promoting the Levi jeans. So that's you. That's me. Oh, nice. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Oh shit. All right. Yeah. Where, where did you find that? I got it from Discogs. It was the only copy available, and I got it just for that song. Holy shit! <laughs> Jay, yeah, me. I, I can't. Frank, Frankie so has fun. audio of your children being born. It's amazing. <laughs> he found all this crazy stuff, and it's amazing. <laughs> he does. Yeah. Oh yeah, you were there, man. That's great. <laughs> there was a lot of people in the room. There was a lot of people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Sally's friend. I remember Sally's friend had to be there. <laughs> it's a boy. No, it's a girl. No, it's a boy. It's a girl. Oh. Frankie has that tape, dude. He's got there it. Go. Yeah, hold on to that one, Frankie. Put it in the museum. Yeah. I I was wondering how it came to be that you you sang lead vocals on a little help from my friends during the Frog Brigade shows. Oh, oh yeah, uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, that was playful, like, <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Biggest weed smoker in the band's got to sing that one, dude. Yeah, that's the, that's, that's, not, the, that's the Ringo part, right? You know, yeah. it, it makes sense. That was fun. You know, that was a lot of fun, man. Let's yeah. get back to the sausage demo era. Come on now, Frankie. Stop talking about David Bowie. You are bouncing around a little bit, Frankie. Where should we go next, man? So, Jake, come on. <clears throat> That moment was a pinnacle moment of you getting out into the club limelight with Les, right? And if you remember when I came on as a roadie, a, roadie, a friend to help out because I loved you guys so much and I was so inspired by you guys, you know, it, it was a really a, a, a moment in the musical scene in the Bay Area that that Les kind of like was the the tiny moment where that demo came out and all of a sudden it 
it, everything exploded with the funk rock and the funk bands and the limbos and the fungo mungos and the, you know, all these bands just started just coming out like that. And, and the thing that really blew me away was, was your playing, man. You know, and when I came on with you guys at that time, you didn't even ha- own a drum set. You didn't have any cymbals. You didn't have any sticks, you know, and you played Les's stainless steel kit, remember? And you did the silver duct tape primus on the front head, all funny. Right, right. And then we, I would, sh- I showed up and it was like, okay. And Les is like, man, dude, you're a drummer. You got any cymbals? I'm like, I do. Have, man, yeah. He goes, well, dude, can you bring your cymbals? Because Jay's got no cymbals and his are all broken and mine are broken. So remember, I would bring my cymbal bag and my stick bag. And you're all, hey, 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 thanks, bud. Oh, yeah, oh, hey, and get sticks. Vic first five A's, dude, this is my favorite. <laughs> it's like, that's, I had a bunch of those. Like, it was like the most amazing moment that was like the greatest drummer on the planet in my eyes at that time. Didn't even own a drum set. You know? Oh, man, that's, that's, that's nice of you to say that, man. I, I think that's probably because I, uh, I idolized Jocko. There you go. He, that, that was him, right? Yeah. That, was, that was that whole personality of, I remember that feeling of like, I shouldn't be <clears throat> maybe because, you know, you see those guys who are like all persnickety about their gear. You got to have your shit set up a certain way. Of course, that's me now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, of course that ends up happening, but you know, uh, I, I, I remember having this mindset, like, no, you should be able to slam it up on anything. Like it's not the kit. It's not the drums. It's not the drums. You know, I think I was just trying to try to really like, be that hardcore about it like nah man it's not the drum just not the drum. right i didn't i didn't really trip on like uh plus i was lazy probably you know i just fucking you know i didn't want to well dude i mean i did gear i ended up pumping gear after that and, you know i think what happens is after a while you start having a few gigs and then you start caring it's like oh man i want to play good now so wait i gotta bring those good sticks that i like oh now i gotta bring right. that good pedal oh that good pedal and nothing feels like that i had a good gig with that oh and that snare drum that sounds better it feels better oh i gotta bring those stands and they look cool hey i gotta have a little splash symbol okay <laughs> next thing you know yeah fucking like like herb <clears throat> well dude i think at that time you know it, it impressed me more than your playing was that you adapted to whatever got put in front of you you know just like what you're saying that's where you were at that time and I don't know if I've told uh, Josh and Frankie you this story, but uh, uh, back in the days of the Freaky Executives, Jay played with whatever was at the club or whatever Freaky the band gear on. was available. You know, okay. you showed up and played. There was a kid or whatever yeah. that they had, and, and you're like, okay, whatever, dude, and you yeah. guys played it. Yeah. And you used to you told me the story one night where where you were like, okay, we we play all these dance gigs and these these you know, big band gigs with your, your herb. Uh, at, well, how would you describe the freakies again? You said it, it, it was, I saw him a couple of times, I had the Tim Bollies rolling around downstage and it was like, yeah, it's a, it was 10 a, dudes it was on a, stage. It was a, you know, eight piece funk band. Funky. Like basically what Bruno Mars and all these fuckers are trying to do now. All, it's like, kind of world, world, now, world. Now beat. There's all these, there's all these young funk bands now. I don't yeah. know. Like, like it's like, it just happened. It's hard. It's kind of hard to watch. But right. maybe, I'm sure it was hard to watch for like older guys in, in the eighties too. Uh, <clears throat> but, but uh, yeah, it was, we were eight piece started out 10 piece, like the Noah's Ark of funk bands. We had two of everything, wow. two keyboard players, two drummers, two lead singers, <laughs> two, two guitar players, one bass player, two right. horns, you know, right. like the full okay. fucking band. Okay. So you told me that, you know, when I showed up with my cymbals and I would help set up Les's drums and I'd give you my cymbals and set them up and give you my stick bag. And you were telling me the story after sound check one night, you're like, yeah, dude, we would do these freaky gigs. And, you know, I had nothing, dude. Cause I was asking you, how do you, how are you this good? And you got nothing. You're like, Oh dude, I just get through, man. Everyone's got something. And I just get through. And I get, I'm like, you don't have any drumsticks. You're like, Oh dude, I go to the gigs and I, dig around behind the drum riser and find dudes dropped or broken sticks and break the tip off and just, I'm good, man. I can get through it with this dude. And then you said one night, dude, we get to this dance club and there was like clean spick and span dance stage. There was no drummers had played for a weeks and you couldn't find any drumsticks. You didn't have any drumsticks. 
couldn't go to a drum store because you, you didn't have any money to go buy drumsticks. And you're like, shit, what am I going to do? And you said, all right. So I went out back of the club and broke a couple branches off a tree out back. That, that's peeled, true. peeled the leaves off, you're went back like in that. and just yeah, did the I whole like, set. I like the way you're building it up. You're building it up really good. <laughs> the long story short is, you know, I, I love your version. I got to be able to tell it that way because I, I, the way I'll tell it is like, man, I showed up to a gig and didn't have, and I forgot my sticks. And they're all looking at me like, you motherfucker, you really don't have any sticks. <laughs> and it's like, and it's like, you know, it's like a Friday or Saturday night down the peninsula where every, there's nothing open. Everything's closed, right? It's, it's nighttime. It's your nighttime gig, you know, or it's like it's past 5 p.m. There's nothing open. I think this has happened to me three times, though, Soya. Oh, wow. Three times. <laughs> no three times. way. No way. I'm, one time, I, uh, <clears throat> one time, I went to, uh, there was a Toys R Us. I think there was like a toy store. I was like, yeah, I'll go to the toy store and get the little toy drumsticks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? And then I, I can't, and now I can't even remember if I actually did that or not. But there's been a couple times. There was one time where behind the band, there was like, the, the, it was like, you know, it was like a tiki party kind of thing. Or there was a little bamboo shit. And so I like <laughs> broke off a couple of bamboos. You know, that was yes. awesome. yeah, I, I had a tree. There was a tree branch night. There was a tree branch night for sure. And this shit works, man. You know, wow. fuck it. You got to get through the gig, man. Yeah. You got to do it, whatever it takes. Uh, yeah, very know? embarrassing, man. Very embarrassing. You know, it was, it's funny when I was 18 years old, but it happened again. Like when I was probably in my thirties again, like I, at one of these, and it was down at, I think it was like a restaurant bar. I was like supposed to be wearing a nice, nice shirt and playing a nice gig. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. And you had tree branches with leaves on them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you're back there swinging leaves, leaves and branches back there with the suit on. <laughs> Anyway, oh, I that, I was just like blown away at that moment, and and watching you play back then, you know, that's the reason why I I was wanted to get in to help you guys was to sit right behind you and not have to fight with all the kids out front, you know. Yeah. yeah. And suddenly, you know, Les is like, dude, so yeah, hey, you're dude, you're cool, man. And it's like all of a sudden I'm showing up with bags of granola and bags of weed, and you're like, dude, this guy so is cool, man. He's got weed, dude. This is awesome, dude. <laughs> yeah, I know it's quite kind of pathetic, man. My drug addiction is like weed is like the re- actually I can almost say weed might be even why I went to jam with Les in the first place because he'd be like, right, hey, you want to come jam? Like I got some weed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm like I shouldn't even admit that, you know. Yeah. Like, Sorry to cut you off. I, I didn't even know his last name for a long time. You know that? Oh, really? Like, I'm not sure yeah. if anybody did. He was just that dude, Les. That wow. dude, Les. Like, dude, Les. I, nobody knew his last name. Yeah. I didn't know last name. Nobody I, knows uh, my last name. Les called me Soya in the beginning. And I, because remember, he used to go, hey, it's Soya. Like, before he nicknamed me that, he'd like break the silence at a party in the kitchen. You know, you know, everyone just stopped talking. And he'd go, Soya, and everyone would laugh and be like, "Oh!" And then you start talking again, and all of a sudden, I became Tim Soya because no one could say my he couldn't say my last name correctly, so I became Tim Soya. Yeah. Yeah. What I was curious about, and Jay, I wonder if this was your experience because it sounds like Soya is tracing a lot of what came after the sausage demo in the Bay Area back to the sausage demo. I don't know if you're if that's what you're doing, Soya, but what what did, what was your experience after putting that demo out there, Jay? Did you feel the waves or did you just go about your business? I think I was I was at that point I had worked myself up the ranks and the freaky executives and I, I really thought we were our shit was gonna make it. I didn't see that yeah. the eighties were dying and the nineties were taking over. Like you said, when the nineties happened it was all of a sudden like anybody that was cool in the 80s boom you're not cool anymore all of a sudden mm-hmm. all these other cats are cool like the, it was almost like an undergrowth like all the undercats like the you know the kurt cobains and the fucking yeah, yeah. that came later but I, like, I think that that les claypool and his primus uh really had a hand on what changed that bay area movement you know from what you were in at the time with the freakies and you know and stuff like that that was all dance orientated like yeah. You know, and the heavy metal, you know, Metallica Exodus scene was going on at the same time. And all of a sudden they all merged and punk merged and Les's funky bass came in with a little bit of all of that. It was like, whoa, Prince, bye. we have our own scene over here, you know, and that's where that went. And then it just went down the hill with the big giant snowball, you know, Dude, you got to give <laughs> you got you to give less credit because as great as it was, like, imagine like. You know, wow, that demo, you know, fuck the demo, right? And then uh, 
Next thing you know, I'm out. Next thing, <laughs> right. Speed. Uh, next thing you know, I'm out. Next thing you know, Todd's out. And then there was that one gig. I, uh, you saw, I must sure you must saw the YouTube where Les is like, "Well, this is my last gig. Man, the Todd's out of here. I'm gonna be on my own." There's a YouTube yeah. where he's like saying that on the it's, mic. It's at the Omni. I was there. Yeah. I was there. Yeah, I was setting up your shit that night, dude. Are you kidding? Next thing you know, he's got fucking. Two new dudes, boom, and he and they and fucking they killed it. So you really got to give credit to Claypool for like persevering, man. You know, I, well, it's you know, it's his it's his dream and and what was in his he, head, and he and he was going. And there, you guys went from when when I met you guys, we were playing doing show. We we I was helping you guys when you were playing at the night break, and there's like thirty people there, you know. Or then we're doing a show at the Oasis, you know, down by Slims, and there's like. 20 people there and then the next thing you know all of a sudden there's 100 people there then there's 200 people then the clubs are changing we're getting to the better clubs you know and and all of a sudden you guys are playing the omni and there's 800 people there you know crammed in there you know he was like he was making that (laughs) he was making the (laughs) t-shirts yeah screening screening the shirts by himself yep i remember one time when he used to live down with uh curtis gomez cg that's uh, where he li- was living when I met him. Yeah, down in uh, in San San Leandro. San Leandro, and I I, I would go over there. I spend a night every now and then, just crash out and take take acid and shit. And one time, one night we were on, we were tripping on acid. And uh, now I don't know if he took if he fucking gave me more than he took or whatever because <laughs> I couldn't move. I was just like listening, <laughs> like he had put on Led Zeppelin or something, and I was like right in front of the speaker going, "Oh my god!" And I look over, and this motherfucker's over there silk screening. Primus shirts, like silk screening, like he's like a little, a yeah. little fucking elf over there in a fact about an acid fucking elf, like just all creating away. Like he made the art, you know, that's where you had the little fly, you know, the little drawing, yeah. Fly, yeah. making yeah. the t shirts himself. And like, I'm like, man, how's this motherfucker do this shit? Like, I, like, I can't even fucking <laughs> wipe my ass right now. This motherfucker, like, he's always been driven like that, you know, yeah. like, kind of yeah. driven, you know. Oh man. So- uh, Josh, can we can we talk about riddles are about tonight? I think we should, man. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I can't get over that. Yeah, so yeah. let's let's get to that. So, so uh, they, Jay, they, I have I have a ton of questions about that period. Well, let me start. Let me start off. Sure. So, so I'll just start off about that. Is that you know when he when Primus was successful and he wanted to do he wanted to do a uh, a thing with me and Todd, right? Uh, and uh, you know, aptly called sausage because that was the name of that tape that we made, right? So, so, <clears throat> so when he and Todd got together to first start talking about that, they instantly was kind of cool. They instantly had all the songs because they were all songs that they had kind of tossed out that they had written beforehand. So it was like, hey, hey, Todd, hey, remember this one? You know, no, 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 that's not right. Hey, hey. And then boom, they you know they they didn't write any new songs. I don't think any of those songs were new. I think oh the one with the the, the truck sounds and shit was yeah song. the last one. Uh, caution should, caution be, yes, should yeah. be used. Yeah, yeah that one that one sounds like it was done yeah, that, on the spot. That, right? It's not a song, but all the rest of that shit was shit that they uh, that they had like not recorded. You know, that, well it was all it was all deep Primus tracks that Les that had done with you. They and and Todd and and he didn't want to bring into the, no, the they, Tim and Lur situation. Made that shit up before I was even in the band. That's what I'm saying. But you had played a bunch of those songs. There's versions of you no, playing some of those songs. No, I had never played any of those songs back in 1988. Oh really? Oh wow. Yeah, no, none of those songs I had played. Wow, I just because I I think when I saw Curveball play, they were doing Temporary Phase, and they were yeah, doing yeah, yeah. When some Curveball of those. before me. I think those were songs that they were, they were probably doing with yeah. Curveball or, you know, definitely or Peter Libby or whatever. Yeah. yeah. That they, they tossed out when they got me, they probably focused on whatever I played with them. Cause that's the thing that I didn't know all those songs. So I think when I got in, they just showed me whatever they wanted to show me. And we went with those main fucking little songs. Probably not. I, I'm not sure how many songs I even learned of Primus. You know, I'm not, I can't honestly say, uh, that in 1988, when I first joined Primus, and he, they had to show me all those songs, I'd probably only played 
the songs that we recorded. I don't think I played. No, any you there was no. Enough. You guys are doing "You Like It," and you were doing. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's right. That's there, right. There's 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 a handful of songs. Yeah, oh, you, Tommy the Cat, you guys yeah. did, and yeah, yeah, we didn't record that, huh? No. Uh, I mean, yeah. we'd have to ask Matt Weiniger if there's any uh, vault stuff from that session but i don't think so no no the, i think i think i think it was the five songs and that's yeah, it we right? had the one day i think we just had the one day yeah. to try to do as much as we could yeah because you know oh because less i think less was paying matt winnegar or something and so he was like we we paid one <laughs> it was like one day for all the music and then there was going to be one day for him to come back and redo his vocals 100 dollars to record it and 100 dollars to mix it <laughs> Yeah, Unless it's like, that's a lot of corn, man. I don't know, dude. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's do it. I'll, I'll come up with 200 bucks. Let's do it. <laughs> he was yeah. swinging oh, a hammer back then. <laughs> wow. There's something interesting going on with um, the toys go winding down because, you know, the version on Riddle Starbound tonight is radically different to the version on Frizzle Fry. But Tim revealed to us um, a few episodes ago that there's actually even a third version of the toys go winding down of, of which, unfortunately there are no recordings available. And apparently it's also really different to those other two versions. Did you ever get to hear uh, or remember anything about that strange third version? No, I have no idea. <laughs> Hold on. Hold it. on, Jay, Jay, let me explain to you what I'm talking about, what Frankie's talking about. <laughs> uh, when you guys played it in 88, it, it was like more of a down to cut down to down down to it was all upbeat and shit, right? Oh, uh, how's it go with Herb? How's the Herb version go? The which version? Like a, the Herb version is like a march. It's really slow. I'd have to hear it again. I I don't know it, but I know the sausage one is very but down. It's like very, very slow and dragged out. It's and Todd's eight. not you're playing like just a really slow dun cut dun grinding down cut. Right, right, right. I'm trying to think cut. how I'm trying to think how the real version goes. <clears throat> it was upbeat like don't cut douche diddle dip down cut down yeah, it was really upbeat, you know. The herb one? The one you did. Oh, and that was the last song that you guys played together before you and like, it was the new song at that moment. You guys oh, bailed out okay. was the toys go winding down. Okay. Oh, yeah. And that's the CG. Yeah. The Mexican was a friend of mine used to yeah. sit around the house watching evil dead at that apartment. Remember that they'd always have evil dead on the TV when you right, go over right, there. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, Can you no, guys play I, something else, man? Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. He had fucking West Les- had all the fucking VHS. <laughs> yeah. yeah. With all the VHS tapes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. shit. So, anyway, so uh, yeah. I was telling these guys about the way I, I learned it in my ears when I was working with you guys in 88 in the beginning. And it was not the way they did it with Tim. And it was not the way you guys did it on that sausage record in 92 or 91 or whatever that was. Oh, okay. Um, Jay, <laughs> according to some anecdotes, it seems like you didn't have such a great time during the video shoot of the riddles are bound tonight, uh, track. Oh, apparently no, there, that wasn't me. That was Todd. Oh, tough. Yeah, right. He got electrocuted, yeah. right? You yeah. saved his life, yeah. Jay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I say I, I, I yanked the shit off of him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks uh, for that. Yeah, I appreciate it, that. I'm sure he did. They, uh, <laughs> they had ungrounded, you know, little wires, yeah, they had the, they were trying to do like the angler fish or with little you know the fish that had the little fucking light bulb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they made a little thing, and these guys were just fucking wiring shit up 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 our backs and shit. And, you know, I, I don't know. And the whole scaffolding, the whole thing is metal, and 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 uh, and Les and Todd had those old fashioned metal mics. And sure enough, so Todd and fucking leans over. That fucking thing hits an arc, the fucking arcs and starts fucking burning his back and he starts go, going like this and shit. And it was like the spandex skin tight shit. And, you know, so I was like ripped off the show, like pulled him off, pulled it off. And I think that, I think that ended the day. That was the end of the day. I, that, ended the, that was like, all right, shit's over now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Mark Carr told us about that. Yeah. He said, he said you all had to chill for a little bit. And then I think you did a, one or two more things oh. after that, but very little. I think. You know what's he, fucked up about that video? Is that they never got their big long shot. 
They always they oh, wanted man. to get us. I remember to them talking about it because because whatever happened, we ended up we ended early. The whole thing was this one fucking giant fucking. Yeah. Thing. You kind of get the idea watching the video, but they right. never got the one shot that fucking went all the way up because they had a crane. There was a crane and everything. And I think that that the, they missed out on getting that one shot that showed the whole fucking thing. The uncut lift of the camera from bottom to top. Because yeah, there's like layers of stuff going on as you go up. They never yeah. got that one, one long shot, man. It's kind of too mm-hmm. bad. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the record in the sense that uh, Soya told us that you and Les laid it down and Todd came in later. The Sausage uh, album, Riddles Are Bound Tonight. But but you told us that you didn't really know any of the tunes. So was there a lot of sitting down with Les and figuring out what your drum pattern was going to be, or did you mostly just bang that out uh, on your own? Uh, he's probably like, come on, Jay Ski, here we go. <laughs> okay, I don't remember. Man. Yeah, yeah, it, it's been a while now. I understand. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think I don't think he he let me come up with whatever the fuck I wanted to come up with. He wasn't telling me what to do. Yeah. Well, Jay, it's interesting that I've talked to less in depth about that record, you know, in our hangs over the years. And because that's one of my favorite records of all of all music of all time, not just a Primus. That that is one of my favorite all time records is Sausage Riddles. And, you know, so I'm always quizzing was quizzing less about it in in our old days times of like when we were talking about it. And, you know, he divulged to me that you and him did that. And then Todd came in later and, and I was like, okay. I think so I was thinking back and, and now that you say it, I, it's right. A lot of those songs you never played before. So, but you listen to them and you, they're, they're structured in a sense, you know, like they go verse chorus or they then solo or bass solo or jam out or Todd goes out. <clears throat> and it's interesting that I had told these guys about how less operates where even if you start jamming, he'll give you like up, go down. And you're, you'll be just playing and going, okay, oh, like this for a bit? And he'll go, okay, that's enough. Now do this. And you go, okay, well, back to that, you know? Right. And like he has that arrangement in his head, even though he hasn't even talked to you about it. He just wants you to free flow on top of his idea that he hasn't told you about. And it all makes sense in the end, you know? Yeah. And some of those songs, I can hear it, you know? I can hear how, because I know Les Claypool's brain about that, about his songwriting like that. On the the Riddles album? Yeah, yeah. 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 Like I can tell, and like in in, in the song, Riddles Are Abound Tonight, you know, you guys flood the beginning and then it comes in correct. And at the very end, it ends. And the song's amazing. And you can hear you going, fuck, man. And Les goes, oh, man, it was all right, dude. That was a good take. (laughs) And then it fades out. You know, if you really listen, you can hear that. And I could just tell you're like, I don't know what I'm doing, man. I'm just trying to play fuck yeah. i think i fucked up and he's like oh, man, it's good. i got it it's good okay let's go to the next song you know see the, the cool thing about Les is like he's one dude that once he makes up his little thing you know he's got to come up with some kind of little weird twangy thing and then all of a sudden that's a bass line now he's got a song right yeah so <laughs> every time he comes up with one of those he'll play that shit the same every time you know like, yeah or he'll just play it like if whether you're there or not you know yeah. that, that's why that's the cool thing about it that that why that I, I could play when I play with Claypool, I'm like right on top of the beat with him, right? Mm-hmm. With her, when Herb plays with him, he's kind of like, oh, you know, he's kind of like there's this like thing. So the cool thing is that Claypool plays like that. He doesn't play differently with me and then play differently yeah. with you, Herb. He's playing the same every fucking time. It's the way the other guy plays that makes it this way or that way, which is really cool. Yeah, like, yeah. So, well, uh, I've told many people over my my span of, of my Primus years, 30 plus, that doesn't matter what Herb's done or what Curveball did or anybody did. And you came back and whatever drummers he's played with, with any band, there's a cosmic connection between his right thumb <laughs> and your right foot. Oh, yeah. That's good. There, I don't know what it is, dude. There's no other connection in the musical projects he's done when you guys get together your foot and his thumb are just like locked cosmically and i don't know what the hell and how that happens but it's it's a chemistry that nobody else has ever locked into and herb and him have had a chemistry that's like not like what you and him have had but and of course tim locks in with him but there is something about from that sausage demo days on that that man that connection is insane dude thank you but yeah it's like herb's thing is like uh 
is is like kind of like he pulls from it and that's what makes that really that's what gives that primus that really tension now, i i love it you know and, and when i, I do too yeah in, in, in addition to the songs that we wrote for the green naughterhide you know the songs that i had to learn that, that her head was playing i mean that was shit was really difficult to, to yeah make, you know it, was, it, it just wasn't really my the way i would play it and i really and you know but Claypool was adamant. It's like, no, you know, we got to play these songs like they go. Like, like, cause yeah. I, I could have just been like, okay, here's how I'm going to play Jerry with the race car driver. Like if I had never <laughs> heard her play it and I was still in Primus and he pulled out that shit, you know, I, I can tell you right now, Herb goes, cause Claypool's going, yep. Yep. and and Herb's just going, that's right. He goes, so it goes, kick drum goes, doom, get, Get do 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 get right. It's just very simple, right? Which is dope. That's mm-hmm. dope. And I'll tell you right now, if I was in the band, I would have been going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. I would have been, would have been all, It wouldn't have been like, uh, you know. Did you guys ever do that in sound check? And and you do what you wanted to do no, on no. that song? Oh, just no. to be just to be funny and say, here's how I play it, Les. No, 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 no. no, no, no. <laughs> The old colonel shut you, would shut you down in two seconds. Yeah, yeah, because because like you said, I think it's not the tie dye anymore. You got to <laughs> show. It's a show now, man. You know, like, you know. Well, Les definitely praises you know your you know, your jams with him with me you know, personally you know, about like here, not personally, but just he always praises you as like you're one of his favorite drummers. Let's, let's that's talk respectable, about, man. Hey, let, thank you, man. You, let's talk about the you suck thing. That's that's Sh- yeah, sure. Kid. You know why that's really deep. Is because it used to be, and I, to me, it used to be like a buffer. Like when when I remember playing like the Berkeley Square and these small clubs, and it's like, yeah, and all these bands were really trying to be good. You know, they had a practice, everybody rehearsed, and it was like I think less less already had the little comedy thing. He even back then he would do his little jokes and shit, right, with the crowd, and and uh-huh. and, uh, and and I think it was his talking and making stupid jokes and shit you know like this next song's called fucking you know whatever they'll name some van halen song or like you know or whatever yeah. this is being stupid and so it was it, it just became a, a a banter thing like you suck yeah. and it was almost like a uh it, it would loosen you up in a little bit in a way like yeah. i remember that feeling of like once they did that it's like oh there's no more tension here. Like, oh, it's okay. We can just relax and and we right. can suck. Like, it's okay. And everyone suck. uncrosses their arms in the crowd and goes, oh, yeah, okay. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah, we like, can like, right. we can watch yeah, this. Yeah, we suck. We suck. Okay. But the funny thing is, later, later, later on, imagine. Mm-hmm. So here I rejoined Primus in 2010. And we play these giant games with this giant yep. crowd. You suck. You suck. <laughs> it was like, wait, 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 wait. This is different now. It's, yeah, it's like yeah. an angry mob going, you fuck, you fuck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a little different. Like it used to be, like you know, one guy over here, hey, you know. It's like a cruel it's joke that your own joke <laughs> bit yourself I in mean, the I ass. Uh-huh. After a while, I can see why Claypool didn't like that shit anymore. Yeah, yeah, totally. He he hates that stuff now. Not hates it. I just, I mean, he's I like, it. okay, I let's all it. move on, man. Okay, we already went through. You know, what, it's almost once to. And here's the other interesting thing. Like, here we are in this COVID times where we're wondering, are these giant, massive crowd concerts going to ever even come back? Maybe even when the shit comes back, it'll be, you know, <laughs> at, at, the, at the most, the theaters again or something. Maybe it doesn't, maybe we didn't, you know, we didn't have these massive concerts even like uh, until the 50s or the 60s, right? We, yeah. So we only had from the 60s till now of massive concerts. There wasn't that shit. That shit wasn't before that. They didn't have right. massive fucking concerts before that, right? Uh, so maybe that shit's gone away, man. Maybe, maybe there's a good thing about that, man, you know? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, you raised a great point about the the way that the crowd interacts and, and your observations of it 15, 20 years apart. That's a, it's a, such a great point that – it was a way to bond with a small crowd and loosen up so you could play and kind of create a connection. But it's something that got out of hand in the sense that there's all these people now and they feel like it's an entitlement thing just to, I can yell at the band and, and I'm essentially anonymous right. if there's 2,500 of us. And I can yell right. these horrible things and get away with it. Um, and all of a sudden the band's not the entertainment. The band is 
just uh, a target, and it's strange. Uh, what oh, people are doing that? Talk about that. I got nailed. I got nailed in the neck with. Uh, this was fucking weird, dude. It's still. I, I. I. almost have to hand it to the guy. Somebody ended up hucking a fucking. And now, okay, I'll. I'll go back in the sausage on the sausage thing. I actually got hit with a shoe. I remember that. Uh, and I saw like a full can of beer land right ne- next to me one time. Mm. And but, but on the on the when, when I rejoined Primus, we were out there somewhere, and I something tagged me right in the neck, like I, it was like stung, like fuck. And I looked down, and it was an empty solo cup. Like somebody mm. ended up hucking a solo cup full of liquid, probably beer. Yeah. You know, somehow g- got like how do you think they got a full solo cup like the. Whoosh, Without the liquid falling out of it, it's almost <laughs> right. like an art, like that, like or, or it's incredibly lucky because I get hit in the uh, with full velocity. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, talk about big mega crowds going fucking nuts. Yeah, it's, yeah. Wow, what a change um, in strange. Jay, uh, well, Josh, before we move on to Green Naga Hive, I just have two quick questions about riddles for Jay that I'm really curious about. Uh, the first one, Jay, may be a long shot because, you know, it was a long time ago. But when you went out on the road in 1994 with, uh, with Sausage, there's a particular show at the Metropole where Brain actually played drums instead of you. Do you remember why? Yeah. Yeah, it's because, uh, because that was the beginning of my fucking realizing that everybody wants to work at the same time. Oh. And all of a sudden I went from having no gigs to having three gigs. And fucking Charlie Hunter trio had to fucking be going out at the same fucking time as the goddamn sausage shit. And I'm like, you're fucking kidding me, right? You know, you you motherfuckers have to book the shit at the same time. It ended up, that's why I ended up going back to Bob Weir in fucking 2013. They booked the fucking thing. It was like this. At the end of it, it was like this. I could have done both of them, but hey, I get it. It's the drummer's always the last one to be considered, man. What are we talking about again? <laughs> okay. Uh, brain filled in for oh, you. Oh, yeah, brain. Yeah, so fucking, they, bo- they booked a fucking, I had to go hop off that tour and go play with a Charlie Hunter for two weeks. So Brain stepped in and played, and, and, and I think Henry Rollins liked him better. Hold on a second. I'm going to interject, Frankie. Just yeah. pause, because I can interject right here. Okay, Jay. Shattering song. Okay. <laughs> Brain, when I found out Brain <laughs> sat in on some of that tour with the Rollins band, and uh, we were on the Holy Mackerel tour, and I was at, and Brain's like, Yeah, dude, I did some of those shows. I was like, Oh, I didn't know that because there's no internet at the time, you know, or cell phones. And it's like, Whoa, like you played that? Do you, you actually had to play Shattering. Wow. Can you show me how to play it? He's like, Oh, man, dude. I couldn't figure it out. And he played it with two hands on the hi hat. Oh, he, Jesus. Wow. And so, so, cause he, he didn't you call you and ask you. He just like said, okay, yeah. I got this man. And he did this two hand thing. No, he, yeah. <laughs> like with two hands on the hi hat. Uh, uh. And I was like, what? And he showed me how he played it. And I was like, dude, that doesn't sound like it. He's like, dude, I just had to get through the gig, man. You know, like brain. So dude, I just had to get through it. I was like, all right. He's like, I was ripping, man. I was ripping. I was like, all right, all right. And so then uh, when he got into Primus later, we talked about it again, sitting on the bus one night and, and we were discussing that same situation. He goes, okay, I figured it out, dude. I called Jay. I asked him. I was, there was no way I was going to call him at that moment on a tour of sausage and say, how do you play that beat? Cause you know, I'm brain and he's just, he's Jay lane, not just Jay lane. He's Jay lane. So it's like, I can't like ask that dude that I'm not worthy to play his beats. You know, Herb had no problem calling me up. Oh, well, you know, dude, it's just, it's so brain. Like, you know, his pride was like, there's no way I'm calling that dude and asking him how it's going to happen. I'm, I figured it out. And then, so then later he said, he finally called you and said, Come on, dude. How do you, how the hell do you do that? And then you broke it down how that right hand triplet snap on the hat with the one down and the double hit up, you know, the double stroke up that. And so then Brain showed me how to actually play it. And that's how I kind of know how to, I can, I can't play it, but I can kind of play it. But yeah, then I understand the complexity of that beat. And it's like, damn, Brain, how the hell did you play that? And then he cheated. 
on the sausage tour. So well. brain well, cheated. I don't think, you know what? I, you're, you're probably the only one that noticed. <laughs> no, I, I didn't see brain play it on the sausage tour. He just showed me how he played it. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. Nobody yeah. in the crowd probably noticed because, you know, sausage was a, a, a peanut in the, the realm of the night. I know. You know? I know, but man, I'm honored, man. You were talking me up, man. Keep it up. Keep it up. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I, I told Frankie and Josh, I, I got a clip yeah. of you doing the, the the shattering song from that Warfield New Year's night. That was a good gig, man. You know, was, uh, oh. I, was, I, was, I, was, I was excited about that gig. We had a good gig. Claypool didn't complain about one goddamn thing. Dude, you guys nice. killed it that day. That's the night that right. I met Frankie out you back. I did not have one yeah. bad thing to say after that gig. And, uh, the only problem is the COVID shit happened right after that. Right? Yeah. I, I thought we, yeah. I would have, I was sure he was going to book some gigs this oh, year, man. Last year. Yeah. I mean, it, we all talked about it in the dressing yeah. room after all, all you, me and Todd and Jay. Oh yeah. Right. So there was, and there was less. some talk about going out. We say that. Wow. So, right. Jay, that's actually my second question about sausage. Uh, you know, it was an amazing concert, just yeah. like Soya described it. And, you know, when I first saw the announcement, you know, after I got my tickets right away, the first thing that came to my mind was, you know, I wonder if they're going to do the full album back to back. And for a moment, it seemed like you were going to do it. But I'm wondering why you skipped Here's to the Man and Caution Should Be Used. Uh, Claypool, he, he, uh, he uh, well, Caution Should Be Used is just a jam anyway. But but Here's to the Man, he somehow he didn't want to do that. I can't, I remember we, we got together, rehearsed, and we started playing it. And he was like, man, I don't want to do that one. Maybe that's something. Maybe uh, I, I can't remember if it was if there was another school shooting or another fucking recent shooting that was bumming him up about, uh, about maybe doing a. I don't, I'm not sure if that song's about guns or not. I can't. Yeah, remember. it is. Yeah. It is. I, it I, is. I, yeah, I, th- I think there was something bumming him about. I think something happened right about that time we got together to rehearse. And he was like, "Eh, fucking good," but you know. It's a bummer. That's a great. That's one of my favorite ones yeah, to jam yeah, with was, my headphones on with you, I was Jake. Looking, I was looking forward to doing that too, man. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you. Was, uh, yeah, you know, it was you know, it was a trip about that one. The rehearsal we had was really good. Thank God the gig was too, because so, sometimes you have a good rehearsal and you have a shitty gig, but uh, and vice versa. But the rehearsal, I was amazed at how what how in tune Todd and Les were. Like they were like, oh yeah, you remember this one? Yeah. And it was of funny. course, they remember him verbatim. <laughs> it was it, it, both it geniuses, dude. <laughs> but like they, it was like they were really like you know. I was I was really impressed, man, with how how in tune they still were with each other. You know, yeah, that's it's awesome because you know, it's yeah. kind of cool that all of us here were there for that gig. Jay, you probably had the best seat in the house, but like we, you know, no, I, was I did. The balcony. Frankie was down there. So it was backstage <laughs> sneaking videos. Thinking, oh, cool, man. Yeah, I was I was at the front yeah. row the entire show. Jay. Yeah, and I. So, what I loved about it, though, what I love hearing is yeah. that you said that the, the rehearsals were good and, yeah. and yeah. the show was good and and that there was some talk afterward because it went so well. Because when I saw on the announcement Sausage, I said, I, I have to go. I have to go. I told my oh, wife, we're going. We have to go. Yeah. Because I love, you know, we love Sausage. Absolutely. Well, I do. I love Sausage. My wife said, what's that? But um, – but I had to go. And so it was real. I'm so glad to hear that it went really well for you guys too, because I'm essentially a layman. And unless there's a huge fuck up, I don't know about it. So great to hear. Um, yeah. Man, it'd be so great. That to was see a great night, man. Jay, remember we got that great pick with me and you and Todd and Les in that dressing room downstairs. And it was like, it all started with these four right here in the van. I, I never I remember never that. Who took that picture? I want to copy. Uh, I, I think Cheney might have taken it. I can't uh, remember. Yeah, I, I think I think my lady got to meet uh, Yoko Ono that night or so, right? Tommy? No, that was. Oh yeah, yeah, Yoko was there. That's right. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, Josh, can can we talk some Green Naga Hive? Sure. I, Jay, how much time do you have for Frank? Uh, I, 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 I got to go pretty soon. I got to okay. we're, we're waiting to eat here. My yeah. food's getting cold. But uh, yeah, let's do it real quick. Come on. All right, Jay. So first of all, I just want to tell you that Hennepin Crawler is perhaps my favorite Primus number of all time, just competing very closely with the Carpenter and the Dainty Bright. But I absolutely love Hennepin. And it's got such a signature sound, you know, from you. Wow. Right from the get-go, you know, it's it's incredible. It's such a BC. It's such, wow, such a BC you. song. I love it. Yeah, thanks, man. I, I gotta I gotta be honest with you. I was really nervous about uh, recording that. And I, I I wish I had I, I I 
wish I'd had more time to get my shit together. It all happened so fast. You know, it's like I was in the band. Here's your new fucking giant drum set. Get it going. Get fucking, you know, use all this shit and figure this shit out. Learn all these tunes. And now let's write some new tunes. It was just, it was just so fast for me. I somehow I wish, I wish we had been able to like go tour and play those songs live and then record them, you know, cause it, was, yeah. it felt so quickly, but it, it, yeah, he did a good job, man. You know, he fucking, uh, he wrote some good songs in there, man. But thanks. Uh, you know, there's another song in particular, you know, I'm going to talk about Tim Alexander for a moment because, you know, he recorded Salvan Pachyderm in the studio and then he was like, oh shit, I got to play that song every night with the really challenging intro. Did you experience something similar with Extinction Burst? Because it sounds like, you know, such an incredibly hard song to play. Oh yeah, yeah. That's yeah. A lot of this stuff was, was, was really challenging to play live, man, you know, because it's like a, it was it was a lot of I was I was getting real sweaty, man. I sweated up a lot of <laughs> a few drum stools there. Uh, <laughs> 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 kind of gross, you know. I had to toss. I think we had to toss one. <laughs> oh wow, <laughs> uh, Jay, am I right in believing that you were, you know, a, a huge influence on bringing the deep cuts into the three D tour stuff like? Hellbound, six, 17 and a half, Return of Sackington, Willoughby, Hats Off, Till Davis Three Farm, all of that stuff. Uh, uh, you had a lot of writing on, on those songs coming back, right? No. Ah, shit, I can't remember. You know what? I might have said, hey, let's do this one or something. I, I might have said that. I can't, I can't remember. Uh, <clears throat> I can't remember if I was really initiating what songs we were going to play. Um, but... Uh, I, you know what, I think it, it might have been, you know, again, like they were stuck playing whatever I knew. So it's like, you know, I would learn whatever I could learn. And then we rehearsed. I think it, as we were playing these songs and Les would pull out different songs and he, he would probably be trying to see how, how well I was playing it. And then, you know, there were some songs he felt I was playing well better than others. But then we would play those songs or something, you know. There was, I think there might have been a song here or there where it was, one of those total herb songs where it's like, no matter what I do, I'm just not going to get, get the shit right. You yeah. know, it's just like the challenge was out. Yeah. There was some, there's, there, I can't remember. There might've been a tune or the tune or two where it was like, it was just a little too much herb for me to fucking try to get it because he's a fucking yeah. brilliant drummer. Yeah. Yeah. Monster. But so just, just riddle me this, monster. Jay, riddle me this. I got a question. Did Les ever ask you if you'd be into playing space farm live? <laughs> Off punch bowl. No. Damn it. Bummer. Do you know that you know that tune? Can you rip that jam? I I I, I think I heard it, but I can't I can't recall which tune it is right now. Okay. All right. Uh, just, it's just always a question a topic on the show. So <laughs> just wanted to see if you remembered if that came up. Oh no, no, no. Yeah, that's no. a joke we've beaten into the ground. <laughs> yeah. Uh Jay, do you remember whatever, you know, came about the MOOC synthesizer song back in twenty twelve? What, what what song is that? Uh, in 2012, you guys did an interview and you all expressed interest in recording a new song uh, using a MOOC synthesizer. Oh. You, I, yeah, it was available at the studio or something like that. And it seems like you guys were into the instrument at the moment. And I you said know. that you were I, going to record I, something. I, what, really? What, 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 are you sure? I don't remember that. Why don't I wait, remember that? Wait, 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 Les's studio or who's studio? No, no, you guys were like doing an interview or something. And oh, and there was, there a, was oh. yeah, and there was a MOOC synthesizer there, you know, at the place where you were doing the interview. <laughs> was Thank you, guys... you. You're, go you're going too deep, dude. You're <laughs> no, seriously I mean, going too deep. Here, here's the thing. If it was something that Les said, it was completely joking. He was like, yeah, <laughs> okay. a, hey, she can't play a fucking MOOC synthesizer. Hey. Yeah. You know I mean? It's like, I don't think... Uh, because unless you're talking about the Taurus pedals that he uses, I'm not sure of any synthesizer going on in, yeah. in Primus, you know? Right on. I agree. So those Taurus pedals he uses? Like, yeah, yeah sure. that's what he's probably was joking about. Maybe you yeah. talking about that. So it, was it was probably just a joke. Okay, so all these years I have been, you know, thinking about, you know, some obscure recording <laughs> oh, dude, in the vault. Look, like, you saw my <laughs> synthesizer over here, you know, I got, I got fucking synthesizers, man. You know, I'm, that's my shit. I love... Synthesizers. Woo. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Ancient alien astronauts, bro. <laughs> Go find it, kids. Jay, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, Jay, uh, seriously, man, thank you so much. Thank you enough. You guys are the best, man. 
I had a great I, time. I wish I wish we could speak to you for like three hours, you know, and even yeah. even though it wouldn't be enough to cover all the stuff. Yeah, yeah, it would be great to talk to you. Jay talking this whole time. I, yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry to interject so much, you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that would be that would be fantastic, Jay, because you know it would be amazing no, to really two. really dive into yeah, this, was just, this was just part one. You know, we 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 only awesome. really got up to fucking 1994. We haven't really, talked yeah. about we haven't really talked about the Frog Brigade. Yeah, you know, I got a lot of shit to talk about that. Yeah, and then, and then you know, and then uh, the few years I wasn't around, and maybe I was playing with Bob Weir. I, you know, I got something to say about music here and there. But, yeah, you know, playing drums, different concepts and shit. But yeah, part two coming up. It would it would be amazing to really dive into Green Nugget Hype Jade because I really love that album. It's one of my favorite albums of all time. You know, Soya loves Riddles. I love Green Naga Hive, and I've listened to it thousands of times since it came out, surprisingly, 10 years ago. I can't yeah. believe it's been so long. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Well, he said it, so let it be done. We'll have a part two with Jay. Uh, Jay, once again, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I really hope you get to get out on the road and play and record and do all the things that you love doing, because we love it too. Right on. Yeah. Thank you, if you need so a much, drum tech, hire me. I need work. <laughs> <laughs> all right, sir. Hi, right, Frankie. Right on, you guys. But I'm trying.